Good morning. Uh, turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 11. Um, just a mini camp update. I think I uh, sent out an email uh, regarding the work days that are coming up in April and May. Uh, so if you can uh, just keep those in prayer. Um, obviously, with Stacy having been away from camp uh, for the last couple of months and will be until the end of April, uh, there's only so much Josiah can accomplish by himself. So the work days are going to be uh, just very important this year to get some help uh, just to get camp ready for the summer. Uh, so if you can be praying that the Lord would uh, send people to help on those work days, that'd be terrific. Um, yesterday we had the director's meeting, so we do that each year in the spring to kind of plan, prepare, talk about the things that might be the most important as we go into this new summer session. Uh, and that was an encouraging time that was down at camp, at least for most people. Some people did still join in online, especially our Canadian friends where the uh, complexities of crossing the border, though they're improved and not nearly as complex as they once were, um, it still is a little bit of an extra uh, process compared to what it used to be. So, um, But that was an encouraging time and exciting to hear how the directors are being led by the Lord uh, as they prepare and plan for the summer. Just one note of encouragement, um, well, two notes of encouragement. The first one is uh, when we look at the registrations through March 31st, and we compare them to 2019, which is the last pre-COVID um, year that we had, uh, our registrations this year are on par with where we were for that year. So that's encouraging, uh, exciting to see. Um, so the second encouragement uh, and ask for prayer is just to continue to pray that the Lord would uh, draw campers to come to hear the gospel and to be built up in their faith. Um, that the Lord would raise up staff to come and to serve uh, throughout the summer. Uh, we obviously cannot do it with 10 people. In a typical summer, it's uh, 350 volunteers throughout the course of the summer. Uh, it's probably 500 positions being filled. When you look at it across all of the, the different weeks and sessions and the different responsibilities. So uh, just much to be in prayer for, and we uh, would appreciate your prayer uh, as we go into the summer. Um, and of course, we're just uh, unbelievably grateful for you, for your support for us uh, as we continue on as the Lord has uh, led us. So that's my announcement time, not my message time, uh, just in case anybody's keeping track. So Hebrews chapter 11, uh, continuing in this series on Hebrews, and we are calling this, the, uh, this section, this little mini-series in chapter 11, uh, the practicing of biblical faith, the practicing of biblical faith. So today we're, we're covering verses 17 to 31, and we are going to go ahead and read that. Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instruction concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. 
By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, once again, we just humbly come into your presence this morning, recognizing that all that we have, all that we are, all that could we ever hope to be is because of you. Father, we thank you that you have brought us into a relationship with yourself through the work of your son, the Lord Jesus, on the cross at Calvary, that our sin would have kept us separated from you for eternity, but Christ's wonderful, precious blood was the payment for our sin. And now we can live a life that is by faith, faith in Christ for the salvation of our soul and the eternal life that you've promised in faith that would help us to walk in this earth as pilgrims and strangers. So, Father, as we consider your word this morning, we just pray by your spirit once again that you would just speak to each one of our hearts. We pray in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, for this little section, I've broken it down to these four sections. Number one, the faith of the fathers in verses 17 to 22. Number two, Faith over fear, verse 23 and verse 27. Number three, faith forsakes, in verses 23 to 29. And then lastly, faith is not foolish. Faith is not foolish. Uh, I'm always so tempted, as soon as I start reading off the four summary points, to just start diving into the details of each one. So I have to catch myself. Um, So faith of the fathers faith over fear, faith forsakes, and faith is not foolish. So, faith of the fathers. There's four uh, little glimpses we see here in verses 17 to 22 of that which happened with the, um, with the fathers. Uh, if you remember, the children of Israel, even in the New Testament times, would always refer back to our father Abraham. So when we look at the faith of the fathers, this is very much so in the context of the children of Israel. Uh, the promises given to Abraham, and we talked about that a little bit last week in the, in the earlier section of Hebrews where uh, Abraham uh, went to the place where God had showed him and, and lived in, as in a foreign land and as a stranger and a pilgrim. Um, so he is the father, the start of the promise that went down. And that promise continued on from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob Uh, and then finally through Joseph. So what do we read about Abraham and his faith? Abraham was tested, and he believed God. Now, the promise had already been made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 that through his seed, all well, in in the promise in Genesis 12 was, all of it through your seed, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. In Genesis chapter 15, they hadn't received a baby, and he said, well, take Eleazar as my son. And he said, no, through your seed, and it says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Uh, Once Isaac was born in Genesis chapter 21, as it was quoted here uh, in Hebrews, it says, through the seed of Isaac, this will happen. So the promise was given But then in the very next chapter, Genesis chapter 22, God told Abraham to take your son, your only son in whom you love, and take him up to the mount that I will show you and sacrifice him there as an offering to me. Now, you can only imagine what must have been going through Abraham's mind. Well, I mean, I don't really know what was going through Abraham's mind, but his actions certainly speak pretty loudly that he believed God. And he went and he took Isaac, his son, and he went to offer him up. And right as he raised up the knife so that he would kill his son as part of the sacrifice, the angel from heaven spoke out and said, withhold your hand from your son. And then he saw the ram caught in the thicket, and the ram became the substitutionary sacrifice. 
Abraham was tested, but he believed God. The testimony here in Hebrews chapter 11 is that it said Abraham believed that God would even raise him from the dead. Now, I am not aware of any experience of resurrection prior to this. Are you? In, in the scriptures. Any recording of any sort of resurrection that ever happened prior to Genesis chapter 22. No, but the testimony in Hebrews chapter 11 is he believed that God said through the seed of Isaac, and therefore the testimony is that he believed that if God said this was going to happen, then if you're asking me to sacrifice my son, then you're going to do something amazing. And I trust you in all counts. When I think of the resurrection, I think of Matthew 22, where the Sadducees were questioning the Lord, and his response is, you are... Well, I kind of like the King James that says, you do err, not knowing the power of God, nor the, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. The New King James says, you do err, uh, or you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. What an incredible faith Abraham demonstrated, that even God would raise him from the dead. Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Uh, it says this in Genesis 27, as he was blessing Jacob, the supplanter, the one who was uh, taking the birthright from Esau, let the people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. Concerning things to come. Uh, always with the future in mind, what God is going to do, the promise given again to Abraham, then to Isaac, the blessing now coming to Jacob, and later on, of course, that gets affirmed also to Jacob. And then it goes on to Jacob, and what does it say of Jacob? And this is one of my favorite portions of this, and I'm going to try not to dive into it in great detail, but it says here, by faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped leaning on the top of his staff. Again, you've heard me say this before, sometimes as we read the scriptures, we just read the words on the page and we don't dive into the depths of it. Why does the writer to the Hebrews mention the fact that Jacob, while he was saying that, while he was blessing Joseph, well, Joseph's sons, uh, and worshiping God, that he was leaning on the top of his staff? Because in the midst of it, in the midst of all of Jacob's life and experience, there was failure. In Jacob's experience, the reason he was leaning on the top of his staff is because when he wrestled with God, God had displaced his hip. And from that point forward, his whole walk and trajectory changed. At that point, he was no longer able to just walk by himself as he was doing before as Jacob, the supplanter, the deceiver. But now his name was changed to uh, Israel, the prince of God, and also his hip was displaced, causing his walk to be different. And all of those days, while you and I might complain, well, maybe not you, maybe just me, might complain that we had to have a staff for the rest of our days because of this situation. We might complain and become bitter. It ultimately caused Jacob to worship. And in that, in the failure, and I'll come back to this again in a minute, in the failure, you can see the faithfulness of God. Uh, Joseph, lastly, in this section, it says he mentioned the departure of Israel while he was dying, mentioned the departure of Israel, and gave them instruction concerning his bones. What are they going to do? I want you to go, and I want you to take my bones with you when you go to the land that God has already promised us. Now, mind you, Joseph, we know the experience of Joseph without dying in, diving into all the details. He was the first one in Egypt because he was sold as a slave by his brothers. And then the rest of the family came, and over time they grew and they grew and they multiplied, but yet they were in slavery to the Egyptians. And yet Joseph on his deathbed, again, not bitter, not distracted, or dissuaded by anything that was going on, was able to say to his sons, carry my bones with you. Why? Because I believe the promises of God. He told us that this is where we're going to be, and I believe what God has said. Therefore, when you leave this place, take my bones with you. So that's the sort of experience of the fathers. What are some of the lessons for us? Uh, number one, 
Uh, fathers are not perfect, and yet their faith is in the perfect one. Fathers are not perfect, yet their faith is in the perfect one. Uh, number two, blessings. There are blessings in passing on to the next generation. And what are we doing? When, like, are we going to model the faith of the fathers in our own lives? Uh, we can be discouraged when we see our own failures, and I'll come back to that next one. So our failures are reminders of God's faithfulness, thinking of Jacob. The failure of him wrestling with God, being reminded by the displaced hip and having to walk with a staff the rest of his days. We could just dwell on the failure, or we can focus on the faithfulness of God and the promises that he's given to us. And lastly, looking to the promises being fulfilled when you think of Joseph. Uh, God said, this is what's going to happen. I believe that that's going to happen, and therefore, when you go, take my bones with you. And are we going to model the faith of the fathers? The fathers passing it down from one generation to the next. I think this little passage of scripture kind of reveals that to us. You go from Ab Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joseph's sons, and it's going through the generations. What are we doing? Are we being faithful, by faith, passing it along to the generations beneath us? And yes, there's a practical application as you think about parents to children, but it's even bigger than that. We're responsible for the generation that's before us, the people that are around us, the generation that's coming after us. Uh, one of the things, and we can think about it in the context of the local church, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just meditate on this for a moment in the context of camp. Uh, you can go back, and there's a picture of three men on a wall at the, in the camp office, three men who had a vision for having camp. Uh, personally, I don't love having the picture there, and it's not anything horribly bad or anything. But we can focus on the vision of these three individuals and forget about the God who's the one who actually caused it to happen. And then we don't think about the 70 years that camp has been in existence. Not technically true, 69, but I'm rounding up. So almost 70 years that camp has been in existence and how many people were involved in the work over 70 years? 350 people a year? I mean, maybe not for all the years, maybe it was smaller a number of years ago, but over the course of the last five or six years, it's about 350 people every year that are involved in the work to, to go forward and go on, passing it along to the next generation. Camp, the ministry, the local assembly does not survive on its own, but by God doing a work and us taking responsibility for what's in front of us to pass it on to the next generation generation. And I just want to come back to this one statement. Our failures are reminders of God's faithfulness. The devil is going to tell you your failures mean that you're not good enough. Our failures are going to be a reminder of God's faithfulness. And don't lose sight of that. That doesn't mean we don't need to repent and turn from those failures and acknowledge and move on from it, but we do need to remember the faithfulness of God in the midst of it. All right, the second section. Uh, faith over fear. And the two examples here in this passage is in verse 23 and 27, as I made mention of. Number one, in verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. In verse 27, by faith he forsook, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him, him who is invisible. So by faith they were not afraid. By faith he did not fear the wrath of the king. By faith, they did not fear. Uh, one of the things that I'm just so struck with, of course, and you've, I've talked about this a number of times over the last couple of years, is how much this world fears. And we fear lots of different things. Uh, and as believers, we fear things. Like, we don't want to talk about it, but it's true. <clears throat> In this particular context, I just want to kind of talk through this a little bit, because in the particular context, it's, um, in both of them, it's not fearing the king's command. So, 
one of the struggles that we have, especially over the last couple of years, is that we do fear the king's command. Yes? Now, we might fear it in one direction or the other. But either way, we fear it. And I'm not taking sides here. I'm doing my best, honestly, to be like Switzerland. But I'd like to give two examples, and you can see where you fall. But there is the fear that if we don't obey all of the government rules that are set before us, that something bad could happen to us, right? And that's a fear. And some would say, well, that's biblical. We need to obey the government. I'm not disagreeing. There's also the fear that government is trying to control us, and therefore we should rebel against them. Yes? So two different fears, both of which is a fear of government. And we allow the fears to drive our, drive our behaviors rather than allowing faith in the one that we can see endure. This is exactly what it said about Moses in verse 27. Uh, as it said, he did not fear. And then it says, um, he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And we've already been talking about this last week and again today. Can we see things that the world cannot see? Yes. By faith. You walk by faith and not by sight. Why? Because by faith, you can see things that you might not otherwise see. And we need to, by faith, turn away from these fears, either side of that, and look to the one who is ultimately in control of all of these things and placing our confidence in him. When you think of fear, and what is fear? Fear is false evidence appearing real. Now, if you were to talk to Shona, and I've said this enough times to you guys, so I think you're all with me, and you all know me fairly well, and I'm pretty transparent, so if you have a conversation with me, you hear all of the good and the bad, mostly bad, um, but false evidence appearing real. I very much live in this space, oftentimes. I start playing things out in my mind and going a little goofy on all of that I'm thinking, and Shona's like, you get stuck in your mind a little too much. You need to get out of your own mind, right? But this is what we do to ourselves. And when we fear, we take that false evidence, making it appear real, we have two choices. Either we respond in fear, which according to the, these next two are from Zig Ziglar, we forget everything and run, and oh boy, do I want to do that oftentimes. Just run. I can't handle this anymore. Can't do it. The pressure's too great, and I just want to run from it all. Or we can respond to faith, respond in faith, which is face everything and rise. Not because you can rise by your own power and your strength, but recognizing and enduring because you see him who is invisible. And you allow your faith in him who's ultimately in control to be the thing that will direct you instead of focusing on the fear. So when we think of some of the things that the scripture would teach about fear, Matthew 10, 28, the Lord Jesus is reminding them, do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul, uh, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Uh, and just a reminder that any king could destroy us at any moment, and that can happen. I mean, Daniel was faced with that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were faced with that. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I mean, they operated in great faith, did they not? Yeah, certainly, O oh king, you could do this. But our God may choose to save us, and even if he doesn't, we will not bow down. Daniel did the same thing. The king's edict went out, not allowed to pray anymore. He said, I'll have none of that. I'm going to continue to do what I've always done because this is what's honoring to God. And what happened? He ended up in a den of lions. And what happened? The lion's mouths were shut. Shocked the next morning when Daniel was just cuddling up to a lion. Wouldn't you like that? I mean, if you ever want to, and I know some in the room don't want to, but you can come over and cuddle up with Mac because he's like a little lion. He's got the nice golden color and everything else. And I can't even imagine how wonderful that would be to actually cuddle up with a lion. Like, you know, I mean, I'm not saying I have the faith to actually do it. I'm just saying it would be nice. 
in the day to come that we could actually do that. It'd be nice. Anyways, the reminder that God has always had, Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 17, they fell, they fell down sore afraid when they heard the voice from heaven and they saw the great light. And then the Lord Jesus stood up and he touched them and he says, be not, arise and do not be afraid. And then when they lifted up their eyes, they saw what they see. No one but Jesus only. Because that's what faith sees. Faith sees. Fear sees everything else around that's a distraction. Faith sees the Lord Jesus Christ. So how do we live in a life, in this life, um, where we can cast away our fear? Well, the next verse, 1 John 4, 18. Uh, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. In verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Faith over fear. Faith in the Lord Jesus. Faith in God. Uh, Some of you know this. Uh, One of my songs that I appreciate a lot is called This World by Cademan's Call. And the chorus says, this world is making me drunk on the spirit of fear. So when you say, who will go, I am nowhere near. Now, oftentimes I think the context of that song is is intended to be like uh, uh, from Isaiah's vision in chapter 6. And this idea this idea that we're going to go. So maybe in the mission field, or we're going to go off and do this thing. But I want to say that when I think on this right now, the spirit of fear prevents us sometimes by walking in faith. Just the daily routine, not even the going off to Africa or the Ukraine or to Russia or anything else to be a missionary, but literally to walk out your door and operate and walk in faith. The spirit of fear. Uh, I think it's Paul told Timothy, but God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and a sound mind. And this is what he would want us to do. Walk by faith, not by sight, not walk in fear, but walk in faith. And we have to remember to feed our faith and not our fears. Okay, the third thing, faith forsakes. So it says this, Moses forsook Egypt and everything associated with Egypt. This, the word forsook really literally means to leave behind all that the world had to offer him. He forsook those things in order to follow after God. It says he endured seeing him who was, who was invisible, as we already talked about that. And then lastly, he experienced his salvation. And that's from verse 29, where it says, uh, where it makes reference to them walking through the Red Sea. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as to dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. You'll remember in Exodus chapter 14, as they came up to the Red Sea and the children of Israel just had this great miracle and experience to leave Egypt, but now they're in front of the Red Sea and they're trapped. They can't get through. And the Egyptian army comes up behind them. And then they start grumbling and complaining. Why did you bring us up out here to die by the Egyptians in the wilderness? We would have much rather stayed there and served the Egyptians. And Moses' response was, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And you know what happened next? The Red Sea was parted and they walked through on dry land. And I'll come back to that in just a few moments. So what did Moses forsake? What did Moses leave behind? So I put this into just four quick things. Number one, power and authority. Number two, the passing pleasures of sin. Three, treasures in Egypt. And fourth, man's religion. So power and authority, in verse 24, it says he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, instead choosing to be called the son of God, following off in relationship to him. Now, you can only imagine the kind of experience that Moses would have had as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. 
great responsibility, great power and authority in the land of Egypt, everybody looking to him for what he was going to do and what he could do. How many of us are honestly thirsty for power? Like we see that in the world in which we live, for sure, do we not? People are thirsty for power and authority. And Moses had that, and yet he forsook it. He left that behind. The second thing, the passing pleasures of sin. It says he instead, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Like, when you look at this in the context, these are some of the reasons that people don't come in faith to God. They don't want to lose these things. But now take it into the context of someone who is in a relationship with God, part of the family of God. Do you get stuck in the passing pleasures of sin? Is there anything that's got a grip on you that's holding you back from walking in faith? Now, we think life should be perfect. We get saved and everything's going to be wonderful. Uh, all temptations are removed. We're filled with the Spirit of God, and therefore nothing is going to ever be a problem. We have no temptations whatsoever. But it's not true. And there's all kinds of different temptations. One of the interesting descriptions here is it's the passing pleasures of sin. Literally, sin is always a passing pleasure. It never lasts. It never stays as something that's going to satisfy you. It's always going to be something that you want more. It's never enough. And yet, it says that he looks for the reward. He knows that the suffering that will come with following after God and walking in faith is worse than the passing pleasures of sin. But the reward for it is far greater an eternal life, not just in the future, on the other side of death, but the eternal life that we can enjoy with the living God now. Thirdly, the treasures in Egypt. It says that he would consider the reproach of Christ as greater than the treasures in Egypt. Reproach, this expression of disapproval. So he was looking forward to Christ, Moses, and forsook the treasures in Egypt. How many of us I am one of them, struggle with the forsaking of the treasures in this life, that we're so focused on what we can build up for ourselves that we lose sight of the treasure and the inheritance that we have in Christ. Moses forsook those things. He looked to the reward. Matthew 6, 19 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. I think of Paul in Philippians chapter 3, he said, what things were gained to me? And he wasn't talking specifically about treasures, but it's the same idea. Those things that were gained to me, these I've counted loss for Christ. Are we willing to give up all of those things and the desire for those things for the cause of Christ? And he goes on to say, Yet, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Forsaking the treasures of this world, for the sake of Christ. And lastly, man's religion. Uh, it says that Moses kept the Passover. Of course, this is a reminder that he believed God when God told him to do this in order to protect themselves from the angel of death, and God would pass over them. But he was turning his back on religion, whatever religion he may have had while he was in Egypt, in order to follow the true and living God. And I think if you really look at this, these are the four things that keep people from Christ. These are the four things that we might struggle with in our own walk with God by faith. We want power and authority. We are enticed by the passing pleasures of sin. We struggle with this desire to hold up treasure for ourselves, 
And we would rather live, even believers, a religious life than a life that is filled with and walking in the Spirit and allowing God to um, walk through us uh, in freedom, in freedom. So faith forsakes all of those things to follow God. Okay, lastly, faith is not foolish. The Red Sea was parted, the walls of Jericho fell down, and Rahab did not perish. Uh, the world says believing in God is foolishness, and, and Paul addresses this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Verse 20, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? It pleased God through the foolish of the message preached to save those who believe. We preach Christ crucified to the Greeks Foolishness. Now I'm summarizing there and skipping some of the words as I read through that. Don't think, oh, John's you know, got his own version. Just kind of focusing on that. Paul's addressing this. The things that God does appears to be foolish. So imagine, again, the Red Sea, children of Israel standing there. Moses is going to raise up his staff or his rod, whatever it was, his staff, I think, at the time, and he places it on the ground, or at least that's how it does, it's done in the movie, and suddenly the water parts, and what does it say? The children of Israel walked in on dry land, as though it was dry land, but the Egyptians, nope, they started getting stuck in the water. It wasn't dry for them anymore. Now, you were to tell somebody, say, listen, we're going to go, and we're going to get caught by the Red Sea, but don't you worry. The waters are just going to miraculously part. The ground's going to be completely dry like there was never any water there, and we're going to walk through, and they're going to look at you, and they're going to say, you're nuts. The children of Jericho, or the children of Israel, excuse me, told to walk around the city of Jericho seven times. I imagine the, the people in Jericho were looking out over the wall and saying, you people are idiots. What are you doing? What kind of army are you that you're just going to walk around? I imagine the children of Israel struggled with that a little bit. Really? We're going to walk around the city. You're going to tell us to blow the trumpets. And then when we do, suddenly there's going to be this great thing that happens. Faith is not foolish. Why? Because God is powerful. God is powerful. The things that he says he will do, he will do. He tells you to do this, you do this. And what happened? The trumpets blew and the walls came and tumbling down. But not Rahab's place, not where she was. Why? Because she placed a red cord out of her window. Hey, listen, Rahab, all you need to do is place this red cord out of the window and then we'll make sure that we come in and save you. By faith, Rahab did not perish. We think sometimes the ways of God are foolish. The world for sure thinks they're foolish. But we know by faith, we can see the evidence of it throughout all of Scripture, that God is faithful. And by faith, we enter into the promises he's given us. Faith is not foolish. And Isaiah, again, Isaiah 55, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways or nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So, in closing exhortation, encouragement. And number one, uh, make disciples. Pass your faith down. Please hear this. Um, number one, like when you consider your families, that is a number one responsibility. Sometimes we think we need to be involved in any of a number of other things, other ministries, everything else. Sometimes we can be discouraged by what's happening. And please, number one, pass the faith down to the next generation. This is what we need to be part of. And then as the Lord gives us opportunity uh, to pass down to the next generation, like with the call of the Great Commission to be involved in other works, be involved in that and be faithful. Be intentional, purposeful. Make, we are made disciples to make disciples. Our failures remind us of his faithfulness and the work that he's going to do. Number two, feed your faith and not your fears. Uh, he has promised to be with us. His perfect love casts out fear, and we can walk in faith and not in fear. And number three, this world has nothing for me. This world, going back to that song that I already quoted a little bit, it goes on to say, this world has everything, all that I could want and nothing that I need. 
this world has nothing. Turn away from this Turn away from all of the distractions that this world has to offer, whether it's uh, the pleasures of sin, whether it's the treasures, whether it's power and authority. He is our inheritance. And not just in eternity, but now. Look to the heavenly reward that he's promised to us. Foolishness of God, the foolishness of God, the fourth point, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Cast your wisdom down to hold on to his. If he said he's going to do it, He's going to do it. Walk by faith and not by sight. Let's pray, and then Caleb is going to come up and close us with a song. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for these examples in Scripture to remind us of your faithfulness. Uh, we know that these examples that are given, are they're not perfect. They're um, men and women just like we are. Uh, there are times in which we struggle to, to believe you, and to walk in, in those promises that you've given to us. So, Father, we pray by your Spirit that you would work in our hearts uh, to commit us uh, to doing that, uh, to walking in faith, to believing you at your word. And so, Father, we just want to commit these things to you now in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.